Please welcome to your screens, ACAM's Executive Director, Rick McDonald. And welcome to this session. My name is Rick McDonald. I'm Executive Secretary of ACAMS. And uh, this session is entitled Special Presentation and Q&A. And I have with me Mr. David Lewis, who is the Executive Secretary of the Financial Action Task. Welcome, David. Rick, hi. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here today with, uh, with you and ACAMS. It's, um, it's the first time I've been with this event, but I've not yet been to Hollywood in Florida, despite having done AML for now 12 years. So I'm, I'm gutted that COVID has scuppered us yet again. Me too. And I'm sure everybody listening is also missing the physical face-to-face -face meetings. But I think I understand that you're currently uh, in Europe, in, in uh, sunny Spain, where you're doing this telecast with us. Yeah, I don't advertise that. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll get others jealous. My team are mostly based in Paris, but uh, I've been working here from Barcelona for uh, a little while now. Um, so, um, yeah, it's one of, the, one of the upsides of COVID. Okay. Well, look, we, we have a little less than 30 minutes. It's really a pleasure to welcome you to this session. And uh, we often have FATF represented because it's obviously the bedrock of international standard setting and policy making, which then cascades down to local regulatory requirements. So I just wanted to kick off, if I could, by uh, asking you to indicate what is FATF up to recently? I say this because uh, it's sometimes get the feedback from many in the compliance industry that while they know the FATF and they, they see the documents uh, and, and guidance uh, documents, for example, but FATF is somewhat more distant from their local regulators. So I'm just wondering if you could give us an insight into what is being done and how relevant that is to current regulatory requirements. Sure, I'd be happy to do that. And I sometimes think that um, Contrary to popular belief that we can be quite political as an organization, we're super technical. And the downside is that we are inwardly focused the whole time. And maybe we don't do a good job communicating what it is we're doing and how it's relevant and why it's relevant. And I, I start off by saying that we're trying to really reconnect right now with, uh, with why anti-money laundering is important. And this is, this is important um, to get political support because what we see around the world is that most governments have now implemented the FATF standards but are not using them effectively. And so we need to raise awareness at political level uh, as to the reason to, to implement the standards and to use them effectively. And it's all about following the money. As, as you and I have spoken about before, this is about the money behind crime and terrorism. And so we're trying to work hard to reconnect with the purpose behind AML. And all our work really is focused on that. So whether you're talking about work we're currently doing on environmental crime, uh, which is incredibly important. Uh, you know, it's at a cost of 280 billion a year, um, threatening uh, human health, uh, threatening uh, the planet, uh, threatening our economies. Um, it's, it's really important that we, we focus on the underlying predicate offenses uh, to make it real for people. So we're doing a lot of work now on environmental crime. That follows work we did on, on illegal wildlife trafficking last year. Uh, we're also continuing to focus on, on terrorist financing. Um, but whereas in recent years, we focused heavily on ISIL, Al Qaeda and affiliates, we're now turning our attention to um, right-wing extremism and, and the funding of right-wing extremism. So we're constantly looking at the new ways money's being laundered and, and terrorism's being funded. But we also have our core mission continuing despite the pandemic of evaluating countries and holding them to account. Uh, and that includes these days on um, virtual assets and virtual asset service providers. So you'll know and, and most of your uh, uh, audience watching will probably be aware of uh, the, the new standards that are now coming in to require the, the regulation of virtual asset service providers around the world and to protect countries and economies from uh, virtual assets uh, being used and abused uh, for a whole host of crimes. Uh, we're also looking at digital transformation. Um, as I said, one of the areas we're, we're worried about is poor implementation. Uh, and 
the big opportunity we see in digital transformation and the use of new technologies, whether it's by the, the private sector or the public sector, is to massively uh, improve the effectiveness of AML measures um, to free up people to work on uh, uh, AML more effectively, to have technology do some of the, uh, the searching for needles in the haystack. Uh, so we're doing a lot of work right now on, on, on digital transformation. We're looking at uh, how that butts up against digital privacy, how we can enable data sharing, not just between the public and private sector, but also within, uh, within financial institutions and between financial institutions. Uh, so we have to do more to enable that. Um, and that includes how do we promote public-private partnerships? Um, and so um, that's, a key, that's a key part of digital transformation as well. Um, so there's a whole bunch of different stuff we're working on. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll go into a lot of those in more detail if, if, if you like. Um, I'd just like to end, I think, with beneficial ownership. Um, this is a broader, a broader focus beyond the AML world, but one where uh, we're continuing to fail globally. The transparency of who ultimately owns companies and trusts uh, is still is still not there uh, and enabling all kinds of crime. So we need to do more on that. And we're currently reviewing the FATF standard on beneficial ownership and we'll be consulting on on changes to that standard later in the year. So that's another really important piece of work. So a whole bunch of different work uh, from uh, looking at how money is laundered and terrorist uh, access funds to setting standards, best practice and guidance, and then assessing countries and seeing how they're doing in practice. And that's more about effectiveness these days than it is about just whether they have the laws and the regulations in place. Well, thanks for that, that very good roundup. I would like to delve more into more deeply into some of those items with you. But before I do, just want to remind the virtual audience that uh, we can take questions uh, for on a virtual screen here. So please don't hesitate if you have a question or two for David to send them in. Uh, so <clears throat> you, I started off by asking you the connection between uh, FATF and local or national uh, regulatory requirements. All of what you've said obviously has an overarching uh, relevance to them, but in more specific terms, how does that get done? What what is that cascading effect when the FATF either puts out some new standards, <clears throat> interpretative notes, guidance, uh, or typologies, or whatever it is that is put out from on a regular basis? How does that actually seep into or become part of the national regulatory set of requirements? That, that's a great question. I think uh, it's often misunderstood. FATF is seen as a regulator, but actually regulation or setting standards for regulation is only a part of what we do. So the FATF brings together uh, government officials from not just its own 39 members, but uh, representatives of 205 jurisdictions uh, and 20 international organizations ranging from the IMF, the World Bank, the OECD, um, to uh, Interpol, Europol, the Egmont Group of Financial Institutions. So we bring those, all those people together. It's a forum, but it's at government level. Um, and they bring their delegations, which are comprised of regulators, law enforcement officials, and others. And so it's, um, it's pretty inclusive. Um, but what it means is that we kind of have our heads a little bit in the clouds when we meet. We're, we're right, at, right up there at the, at the top level. And when we set standards or we issue guidance, uh, the first customer of the standards and the guidance is, is, is national governments. Um, so that will go first often to ministries of finance um, or ministries of home affairs. It's, it's often one of the two um, are responsible for financial regulation uh, and also for law enforcement matters. Um, and then as governments, they have to decide how to implement these. And so they will then issue um, uh, their own uh, laws and regulations, um, which have to be um, implemented by regulators and the regulators themselves who are independent from government need to then pass uh, 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 their own guidance for firms and then have to supervise uh, the implementation of that. So you've got governments, you've got national um, regulators, uh, and then you've got firms and FATF really sits at the top of all that. But we recognize that whatever we do at this top level has to really be informed by what's practical on the ground. So we're trying to significantly increase our engagement directly with firms. 
Um, that's not to bypass national governments and national regulators, but we need to understand the impact of the, uh, the standards we're setting at an uh, international level on individual firms. So for example, next week we have a meeting of our private sector consultative forum where we'll have representatives from the virtual asset sector um, at firm level. You know, we'll have people like Facebook around the table where we'll talk about uh, what our standards require and we'll hear from them on the challenges they're facing. So we try and bridge that gap, um, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a triangle with, with the FATF at the top, a long way from, from where this stuff is implemented on the ground often. And I suppose we have to remember too that uh, FATF is not uh, an amorphous, uh, distant international organization. It is actually uh, comprised of the decision makers who are heads of delegation from individual country members of FATF. So I guess that's, that's the, the uh, absolute connection between each individual country and the rules that the FATF puts in place. Yeah, so around the table, when we sit, when we meet, we have uh, one person who is the head of delegation representing the whole of each member government. Um, and they have to coordinate activity internally within their, uh, within their government. And that includes all agencies, um, policy departments, uh, and operational bodies. Um, and so that's how it trickles down. They're the decision makers. And they have to balance off AML policy priorities against other policy priorities as well. So, in effect, it's, it's worth paying attention to uh, what the FA is saying and doing and putting out uh, in terms of written material because that has become, and if there's new material, it will become part of the national regulatory regime. So, we're actually getting questions coming in, so I might uh, intersperse our discussion with some of those uh, now and then because uh, some of them uh, hit on some of the issues that you've already raised. Uh, and in sure. no particular order. Um, one question is, tightening up standards, laws and regulations is fine, but isn't the real problem that law enforcement isn't properly funded and skilled to address financial crime, including money laundering? What's your take on that uh, type of question? That is a real problem. It's not the only problem. Um, we are now assessing uh, effectiveness, as I said, not just technical compliance. Um, and if you look at those assessments, there are failures across the board, but um, there are some pretty good examples actually of financial investigations, uh, investigations and prosecutions for money laundering and terrorist financing. A recent great example is the mutual evaluation of New Zealand. Um, you know, uh, there's often a lot of criticism of AML for uh, poor asset recovery, given all the efforts put in by the private sector. New Zealand are, are a really good example of good asset recovery. Uh, and it shows that if the standards are implemented properly, then uh, in, in a risk-based uh, approach, then you can get really good results by law enforcement. Um, on the contrary, what we see with supervision and with preventive measures by firms is pretty poor levels of compliance. So 75% of countries evaluated so far, that's, that's about 75 countries. Um, you know, there have been just over 100 evaluations against the latest standards. Uh, they fail on supervision. They require fundamental or major improvements to supervision. And that, that flows down, obviously, to compliance by firms. Uh, and we're seeing basically 100% uh, a failure by compliance by firms. That, though, it misses the differentiation between financial institutions and what we call designated non-financial non professions and, and businesses. So financial institutions are actually doing a lot better than lawyers, accountants, estate agents, casinos, and all the rest. And there is a big issue there that needs to be focused on. But I don't want to miss the point of the question. I think the point of the question is firms are putting in a huge amount of effort these days, particularly big banks. They're filing increasing number of SARS. I think in the US this year, we're looking at over a quarter of a, uh, a, quarter of a million uh, SARS in, in the US. Um, and the story across the world is that generally FIUs are not well resourced. They don't make best use of technology. And so I think it is fair to say that the investment on the public sector side is, is <laughs> starting to fall short of what we're seeing on, on, in the private sector by regulated firms. Um, and so the investment being made by banks is not being matched. Um, and we're not making as much use as we could be of all these suspicious uh, activity reports, transaction reports that are being submitted. But of course, technology will help there, which is 
why we're also focused on, on digital transformation right now. And that last point that you made, <clears throat> not enough uh, is being made of the SDRs or SARs. Um, that, <clears throat> excuse me, that, that's a discussion we could have for quite a while because it is something that's been asked for in terms of reform in many countries for a number of years. And I think that there are lots of reforms going on, including and especially perhaps in, in the United States with the, the new BSA reforms to the law there. I won't delve into that now, but that's part of what uh, I think your, your message or what you're uh, indicating to us. I just wanted to, uh, to do justice to the questioners. <clears throat> um, let me go back to some more. Um, one of them relates to what you just answered before. <clears throat> How do you assess effectiveness in assessing countries? It seems it's based part, in part by charges or convictions. Is that the best gauge? You've partly answered that. Do you want to add anything to that? Because there's more than one side to this. It's not just law enforcement, although that's a primary part. Yeah. Yeah, I know it, it's, a, it's a really difficult task. Uh, we have a, uh, a methodology which is on our website, sets out exactly how we do it. Uh, there are 12 immediate outcomes, no, 11, uh, sorry, immediate outcomes, which identify the outcomes we're seeking from the implementation of the standards. And they range from understanding risk um, to implementing pr um, proliferation financing uh, measures. So um, they're pretty broad. Um, they do include supervision. They do include... Uh, preventive measures by firms, also uh, action to prevent the, the misuse of uh, companies and trusts through uh, lack of transparency. So we have an outcome on beneficial ownership. We have an outcome on financial investigations. And that's not just focused on financial intelligence units. It's focused on whether um, competent authorities, law enforcement, are making best use of uh, financial intelligence. Uh, we then look at investigations and prosecutions or money laundering for terrorist financing. On the terrorist financing side, we look at disruption as well as traditional law enforcement methods. Um, and so it's across the whole gambit. International cooperation is a, is a big piece of this. Uh, but it's also subjective. Uh, it's not black and white. And critically, uh, and contrary to uh, popular belief, it is based on risk. So the evaluation is not the same in every country. We don't expect the same thing of every country. Um, what we, we have a common set of standards, but we start off when we're assessing effectiveness, looking at the risk context of the country, risk and materiality, as we call it. Does the country understand its risk? Can it demonstrate to the assessors that it understands its risks? And does it have a strategy in place to respond to those risks? And if the country recognizes that its companies are being abused, um, uh, trusts are being abused, for example, but it doesn't have action in place to mitigate those risks, then, then we hold it to account for that. So um, we start off with really testing a country on whether they understand their risks and then whether their response is proportionate to the risks that they themselves have, have articulated, maybe in national risk assessments that, they, that they've published or other means of, of assessing their risks. So it's, um, it's entirely risk-based. It does vary from country to country. And the response we require varies based on the risks that countries face. So uh, the reverse of that coin, I guess, would be uh, uh, what financial institutions <clears throat> have to face up to in terms of doing their own uh, risk-based approach to clients and products, et cetera. Uh, and how do you see that? Th is that being done well across the globe? In it's terms not of being hand -hand? done well. Yeah, so, I mean, we, 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 it, it's not being done well. It's being done better by financial institutions, as I said, than it is by um, others, lawyers, accountants, casinos, you know, the so-called gatekeepers, um, where I think there's a much, much bigger gap and a, and a need for a much greater focus, including by the FATF. Supervision, I think, is much poorer when it comes to um, those non the non financial sector, um, so um, but part of the problem here is supervision itself. So one of the reasons I think that firms are failing or are not getting credit is supervisors are not taking a risk based approach to supervision. They're often often taking a zero tolerance approach to supervision. Um, so one of the ways in which the FATF is trying to address that is through providing guidance to support supervisors in implementing a risk-based approach. And where we find supervisors fail the most is where they're needed the most. So often in developing countries, um, smaller countries with less capacity, their, um, their approach to supervision is much less sophisticated, less nuanced. 
They don't understand the risks as supervisors that their regulated sector faces. And therefore, their supervision is poor and they promote a poor reaction by firms. So we need to focus a lot more on improving supervision in order to improve the response by firms. Um, and so um, uh, just uh, earlier this year in, in February, we published um, a guidance for supervisors on how to use a risk-based approach. And that pulls together um, best practice from uh, supervisors around the world and, and, and gives examples of, of what we expect to see. Uh, and I think firms might find that helpful as well. And we've seen firms pushing this as well with supervisors. So you've got FATF sort of pushing down on supervisors and firms pushing up on supervisors, all promoting uh, a greater focus on effectiveness rather than what we all too often see, which is a, still a, still a tick, box, tick box approach to, to supervision. Well, that, that kind of reform, I'm sure, uh, and that collaborative approach is uh, something that would be music to the ears of most compliance officers. <clears throat> if this is a good segue into another question from the virtual audience, which I'll read to you now. Regarding digital transformation, which, which you mentioned earlier, how does the FATF see this affecting countries where digital banking is less used and or less available? How are these countries uh, to keep up with their AML efforts in the midst of FATF progress within the digital arena? It's a big question. Yeah, it's a big question. And digital transformation is, is not just about those countries with digital banking. Um, it's about how artificial intelligence, data mining, data analysis can be used by the private sector as well as the public sector to improve um, the efficiency, but also more importantly, the effectiveness of AML measures. So when we talk about digital transformation, we're, we're, we're talking in large part about that. But when it comes to the digital world, um, uh, actually, um, it's, it's a bit of a, a mixed bag because if you go to um, countries, you know, countries in Africa, for example, they're often the most advanced when it comes to um, digital banking, online banking, uh, mobile phone payments, for example, M-Pesa in, in, in Kenya has been you know, long established and is being rolled out. So I think they kind of got ahead of the game in, in many respects. Where I think we, we can really benefit is in areas like digital ID, uh, and we're seeing um, big progress in countries like India at the moment with, a, with the adoption of digital ID. And I think that will help massively uh, with onboarding, um, with onboarding customers. And I think that can be used uh, around the world. And, you know, uh, this afternoon we were talking with the IMF about how we can make better use of that um, to support uh, less developed countries. Uh, so digital ID, I think, is really important everywhere, um, but it also presents risks. Um, it's it's not say a panacea, um, and we need to in, uh, ensure the sort of safe and responsible use of digital ID. So so last year the FATF published guidance on uh, the use and adoption of, of digital ID, uh, and again that's on our website. And I'd prefer I, I'd refer your guys to that because that I think that's a key part of the picture here. Well, that that gives me an opportunity to do a little advertising. To uh, later this afternoon, uh, there'll be a session in this Hollywood conference about the results of a survey that uh, ACAMS and RUSI have just jointly uh, finalized and the, the results in that uh, relate to digital identification in particular. So let's uh, hopefully that will be interesting to the audience. So stay tuned for that later today. Um, <clears throat> another question here uh, with AML, what, sorry, while AML regimes grow more comprehensive to capture more illicit activity. I'm glad that's a vote of confidence. Uh, how will we manage the potential conflict with privacy demands and undue imposition on legitimate activity? This balance between so, privacy um, and need is has been around for a long time. Please, please go ahead. Yeah. So you, you'll know this is yeah this has been a long uh, around for a long time. Um, but I'm pleased that we have currently have a German presidency um, and. Um, uh, you'll know, most, and, and your, um, I was going to say your listeners, this feels a bit like a radio show. Uh, your listeners will know well the history of Germany and, and, and privacy, and, and they have a strong interest in privacy. You know, they're key, key people behind the GDPR regime in Europe. Uh, but our German president, Dr. Markus Player, has recognized the importance of bringing together um, data privacy policymakers with AML policymakers to try and rec reconcile some of the issues here and show that it is possible to have an effective AML regime 
and um, uh, an effective data privacy regime. Often when you bring these people together in the same room, they're in violent agreement, but we know you just need a lawyer from one of the banks to get involved and they go, well, it's not quite that clear. And so we need to make this real as well for policymakers and help them understand that um, uh, what additional guidance is necessary and what practical barriers exist. So that's, um, you know, data privacy is one thing. Um, there's still um, some sort of myths around uh, uh, tipping off, tipping off provisions and how that may prevent data sharing. So we're working hard this year under the German presidency to bring together all those stakeholders to try and reconcile those, some of those issues. Um, and Europe is right at the center of it and it recognizes that it, it is, um, but it is possible. And just like AML and financial inclusion, uh, they should be complementary. Uh, we just need to work through the detail of that. So the struggle for, um, if, I, if I can put it that way, for what a private sector usually wants quite justifiably <clears throat> is uh, regulatory certainty. This is a, an element of trying to achieve that, I assume. Yeah, absolutely. And if we can, if we can bring some guidance out of it, if we can encourage data protection authorities to provide more guidance and AML provide authorities to provide more guidance that is consistent, then I think that will help. I think you will always, though, have um, lawyers for firms who are having to implement this who will have different risk appetites. Um, and you may look at the, uh, you know, the fines for failures of data uh, privacy may may outweigh those for for AML failures. And so um, you will see, you know, risk appetite continuing to play a part in this, and that will determine uh, how um, how happy firms are to share information with other firms within their within their firm and across countries and with the authorities. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the uh, the questions are coming in thick and fast. I've got only uh, just under three minutes to deal with a few more of them. Unfortunately, I don't think we'll get to all of them. Uh, but one of them is close to my heart from my own background. There appears to be growing expectation that compliance analysts are expected to be investigators, thus greater emphasis being placed on the quality of SARS submitted to law enforcement. What's your take on that? That's the question. I think, that, yeah, so I think technology will help free up compliance officers to do more of that. Um, we don't want people to be sitting there and, and going through all these these false negatives. Uh, the, the huge volumes of those that are generated. So I think there is scope for compliance officers to apply more of their expertise. Um, but that said, um, compliance officers should not be on the front line. The front should stay with, with, with law enforcement. Uh, and we just need to make sure that law enforcement are getting better quality SARS so that it can be properly investigated by the authorities that need to do the investigating. So um, we need to be careful with all the focus on compliance that we don't disenfranchise or take the focus away from the need of law enforcement to do its job and for properly resourced FIUs to ensure that the information gets to law enforcement. Okay, um, another question, and we've got uh, only a minute and a half. Um, this says how countries have been evaluated in the FATF gray list. I'm assuming that means What's being done in relation to countries who wind up in the grey list? Sorry, you broke up a bit there, Rick. Can you repeat that? The question was, uh, how is FATF evaluating countries on the grey list? Oh, well, how do we evaluate countries on the grey list? Well, first of all, countries get onto the grey list, mostly as a result of a poor mutual evaluation and they meet the threshold for entry into a scrutiny process by a FATF working group. Countries are then given 18 months, or at least a year, to address the deficiencies identified by the mutual evaluation. If they are unable to resolve those within a year, then uh, the FATF agrees an action plan with the country, and the country is placed on the grey list. Um, and the action plan includes a set of deadlines, timelines, dates, by which um, certain actions, specific actions, need to be addressed. Um, and so uh, we work co cooperatively with countries to address specific deficiencies, often over a period of um, 18 months to two years. And, it, and it's really, really effective. You look at Pakistan. You know, Pakistan have done incredible things in the last two years as a result of being on the FATF grey list. Um, and it's practical. 
practical results as well. You know, they're identifying terrorist cells that they didn't know about before and taking action on these terrorist cells. So the gray listing process really works. <clears throat> well, that, that's good to hear. We're out of time, but I can't help putting this one question to you as a, a finalization. And if you could perhaps answer it with a yes or no, <laughs> which is putting the pressure on you. Um, would you like to see more errant gatekeepers, bankers, lawyers, accountants, the facilitators uh, put in jail to send a message to their peers? So you're breaking up again. I'm going to interpret that as would I like to see them go to prison? Yes. Yes, I would. Uh, that's probably not the deaf view, which would be a bit more nuanced than that. But the effectiveness and dissuasiveness of sanctions is often in question. And I don't think we've seen enough individuals um, be put behind bars yet. And I think that's the ultimate dissuasive sanction. Uh, fines will always be priced in. So, yeah. And that's, that's I guess, all, always the ultimate uh, policy outcome. Prevention, and if not prevention, then prosecution. So, David, we've come past uh, our time. Uh, so I'd just like to thank you very much for giving your time and expertise 